Well, you know, there's several answers that the Christians of the past have come up with. One of my favorites, because it's the most ridiculous, is that those promises only belong in heaven. They're not for here on earth. I don't still can't figure out where they come up with that. I don't find it anywhere in Scripture, and I've looked it all the way through looking for that answer, and it's not in there. Another one is that those promises are only for certain people, even worse. Or maybe the promises were only for the first century. Still doesn't make any sense. There is one answer that is mildly correct, and that is sin, because sin is missing the mark. But let me just offer you one more possible option. When we sin, we settle for less, right? We've got that, got that pretty clear. Okay, now let's just flip that. You guys know what reciprocating is? I remember that from my algebra days, where you can take something and flip it over and it still means the same thing. Let's flip that over and see if we can reciprocate it. When you sin, you settle for less. When you settle for less, you sin. It's true. Let's look at it this way. What would have happened if Abraham had refused to leave his homeland for Canaan? What would have happened if Joshua had given up in prison instead of continuing to serve? What would have happened if Moses had refused to tell Pharaoh to let his people go? Or if Gideon had refused to lead 300 people against tens of thousands? What would have happened if I had uh, refused to audition for my first musical? That goes right along those, doesn't it? Doesn't that fit well? (laughs) <laughs> i got to tell you guys a little story. Oh, thank you, Alora. That's very kind of you. Let me show you what I mean, and then, I'll, and then I'll show you how the illustration works. When I was a teenager, my freshman year, I decided not to audition for musicals. I knew I wanted to act. I loved acting. I loved singing. My whole family sang. But my sister told me that the choir director was a real bear, and he looked it, too. And this guy was a wall of man. And he had that, his beard was kind of like mine, but it was big and bushier. And he was tall and he was broad and he was a baritone. So he's got a chest the size of a barrel. You know what they say, barrel chested? I think they got him and said, oh yeah, barrel chested. And this guy was huge and he was mean. Boy, when I saw him one time get on his students and he just, you know, and yelled at him and his whole body would shake. Scared the tar out of me. I don't have anything to do with that guy. And my sister had taken choir and she said, don't have anything to do with him. He's mean. We actually became pretty good friends, he and I. (laughs) Because I was a good student, go figure on that. I didn't misbehave, so he liked me. But here's what happened. I was afraid to try out my freshman year, so I didn't. My sophomore year, well, the summer before, I lifted weights all summer and hurt my neck in order to play football and then realized that I hate sports <laughs> and I hate the heat and I hate running around and hitting other people and I like acting, but the rehearsals and practice were at the same time, so I had to pick one or the other and I said, forget this, I'm I'm going to go into the musical and try out for the musical. Isn't that a great <laughs> counterpoise? I'm going to play football. I'm going to go play, be in a musical. Yeah, it was... I'm sure that's what my friends thought too. And here's what happened. I walked in. I'd never done this before. I walked in and I sat down and they handed me a script. And they said, who do you want to read for? Well, of course, everyone wants to read for the lead. So we were doing Grease. Is it Danny? Is that the guy's name? The greaser? Anybody know? I think so. Anyway, whatever his name is. The lead in Grease. Those of you who are nodding your head, you know the answer. Shame on you. Um, and uh, so I'm reading for this character. And as I'm reading, I realize this is ridiculous. This guy is cocky. He's sure of himself. He's big. I wasn't big, you know, even smaller than I am now, you know. And, and he was, he was, you know, tough. And I'm thinking, this is not me. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to get this part. And of course, I did terrible. I didn't sound anything like the character. I didn't do the right accent, which, you know, I should have been able to do, but I, I choked. And I was about ready to give up when the director, who was running the audition, said, flip over to page such and such and read for Vince Fontaine. You guys know who he was? The radio disc jockey? And so I, I flip out, I was like, okay, I'll read for that part, that's fine. And somehow something clicked, and I started talking like a radio DJ, and everything was exciting and fun and fast, and of course all the words are right there, so I just read them. He started laughing so hard, he was kicking his legs in the air. I am not exaggerating. Everyone else in the room was laughing, and then he shouted out, we found our DJ! Now you may not know this, but you're not supposed to tell people what part they get while they're auditioning. You're not supposed to do that because what if somebody better shows up and then you have to tell them, I'm sorry, you don't get the part. Apparently, nobody else showed up that could do that. Now, why do I tell you that story? A, because it's funny. But B, 
Because I met my wife on the stage for Greece. Because while I was there, I came out of my shell and realized that I could be entertaining to people and that people could actually have fun around me. Because before then, I was a complete introvert. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I was, I was the weird kid sitting in a corner that smelled funny and, and said odd comments. You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's me. I know some of you are like, that's not much of a stretch. It, yeah, it's, I know. It's okay. I got out of some of the box. I kept my foot in there just in case I ever wanted to go back. I came out of my shell. I, I, be, I, I realized that I could be more than what I was. I met several individuals while I was there that led me to a teen, Teens for Christ group that uh, through that I rededicated my life to Christ and got on fire for Jesus and never went back. I realized at that point in time that I wanted to do drama and theater for the rest of my life. I, I didn't get to, but it, it's what motivated me to be a teacher. If I had never become a teacher, I never would have gone into youth ministry. I never would have gotten into radio and you guys never would have heard of me. Is that important? Now, why do I tell you the whole story? Because I didn't settle for less. Now, that's not a godly thing, trying out for a musical. It's not necessarily ungodly. The next one I did was, it was chorus line. But, yeah, even worse. But, if I had decided to give in to my fear and not audition, my, I would have settled for less than what God had planned for me. And that we do the same thing all the time, every day. We settle for less. God says, I want you to talk to that person, and we say no. God says, I want you to give to this thing, and we say no. God says, I want you to serve in this capacity, and we say no. I want you to help this person, and we say no. I want you to read this in your Bible, and we say no. I want you to spend an hour with me in prayer, we say no. Why? We settle for less, but somehow we get it in our mind that we know better than God. And when he says, I want you to do something, we say no because we think we know what's going to be best. And we eat the the Splenda, I'm pointing at Cheryl because she loves Splenda. We eat the Splenda instead of the real thing. We settle for less. Why? Why do we do that? Well, for some of us, we settle for less because we're just too lazy. We just don't want to do it. God says, I want you to do this. And we say, oh, man, that's a lot of work. That's not real common in Hoxie, by the way. The problem in Hoxie more often is God wants you to do it and you say, I'm too busy. Oh, God, I've got so much already going on. I don't have time to, to, to add one more thing to my list. Or maybe we're too distracted to even hear from God. He says, I want you to do this and we just don't hear Him. And sometimes we say no because we're afraid we'll fail. Now let me show you what's common about all of those. They're all about you. We say no because we are too self-absorbed and not into God. That hurts, doesn't it? I don't like hearing that because, you know, you guys may think that, oh, well, you know, the pastor, he always does what God says. No. No, I don't. And when I don't, I settle for less. 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 says, To obey is far better than sacrifice. John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, obey my commands. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For all who, led, for all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. How should we make our decisions day to day? We should be asking God first and say, What do you want me to do? And you know, don't just give Him options either. I know one guy, he wakes up in the morning and says, God, what do I do today? And he says, it's been working for many years. Everything gets done no matter how crazy what he tells me to do sounds. Got a list a mile long. And he says, God, what do you want me to do today? I want you to go to the park and sit on a bench and pray. Okay, we'll give that a shot. So he goes to the park and sits down and you know what happens? Somebody shows up who needs prayer. He prays for them, changes their life. And somehow everything else in the office still gets done because he doesn't settle for less. What are you settling for? What are you settling for? If you don't step out in faith, you can't go anywhere. 
When you put your feet down and you say, this is as far as I'm going to go, God. I won't do anything but this. You can't go. You can't move. You know, it's really hard to fight with your feet planted on the ground. You have to be able to move. It's really hard to grow with your feet planted in the ground because you need to be going that way. We settle for less and we don't move. We don't grow. Our lives aren't exciting. I remember one time I told an unbeliever when I was a teenager, uh, after I had gone to TFC, I said, uh, he said, I don't want to be a Christian. It's boring. And I said, what's boring about being a Christian? Well, I didn't know that for a lot of Christians it actually was boring. But, you know, by then I had already told God, God, do whatever you want with my life. And I was really excited. And so I was doing everything he wanted and then a couple other things that he didn't. And so, you know, I still got into trouble. But, boy, I was excited. And it was an exciting time. You won't have that. You won't have the fulfillment of getting it right. Remember the story of Kara and her and her biker playing? <laughs> her biker, that sounds terrible. Uh, the biker that she ran into that, that God told her to go talk to. If she hadn't have done that, she wouldn't have received the fulfillment of knowing that she had done what God wanted. There's joy in that. The other day, we were sitting on the couch watching a movie. It was a dumb movie, but there was a part, part in the movie where the music had a really good beat. And every male in my family has a good sense of rhythm. And we just, you know, you ever drive with me in the car and the radio's on, I'm tapping the steering wheel. Anybody else do that? You know, you just, you, you just can't help yourself. You're tapping your leg and that kind of stuff. So we're sitting there watching a the movie, and next thing I know, I, I hear the beat. And I look over, and Kai is tapping his legs to the beat of the music, and he's flourishing and everything. And I looked over at him and was like, way to go, Kai. My gosh, I thought the poor kid was going to come out of his skin. He was so excited that his daddy was proud of him. That's what happens when we do what God wants us to do. He looks down and he says, good job, man. Way to go. And we go. <laughs> it just boils up inside of us until it's about ready to explode. You won't have that if you're settling for less. We receive joy. When we obey, we receive rewards when we obey. And when we don't, we settle for less than what God has for us. There's a great story of a man who goes to heaven. He opens up a door and inside there's all these wonderful treasures. And he says, what is this place? And the angel says, this is what I had in store for you or what God had in store for you. But you didn't receive. How much are we missing out on? How much are we not receiving? What are we settling for? I want to encourage you guys to not settle for less. I want to re repeat what I said before. When we sin, we settle for less. When we settle for less, we sin. Or maybe that'll motivate you. You don't want to disappoint God. And we think that it's no big deal if we don't do what He says as long as we don't do the things He says not to do. No. He wants us to obey. He doesn't want, to just, want us to just sacrifice our pet sins. It's much more important for us to do what He says. So let's decide to obey what God has us for us to do. And that goes as a person and as a congregation. If God wants us as a congregation to do something, you think, well, that's kind of weird. That's going to be a waste of time. Don't settle for less. Do what He says. Because everything He tells you to do is good. Because he's, His plans for you, they're all good. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that your plans are good. That what you want for us is amazing, more than we can even imagine. And Lord, I just pray that you would be clear and loud. I know that you speak with a still, small voice so much of the time, but help us to learn how to hear you and to obey you. To have the strength to step out in faith when you ask us to. To not hold back. To not settle for less or miss the mark. But rather to step up and to step out in faith. Thank you for forgiveness and grace when we don't, for giving us infinite chances. But Father, I don't, I don't want to just hit the reset button. I want to get it right. So give me strength through the Spirit, Lord, to get it right. And help us all here today to do the same thing. And we could all get it right and change this world for you. In Jesus' name, amen.